All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am super excited to have Tori here from Retired Party Girl. And I think I've been for following Tori on Instagram for like over a year. Um, so it's super cool to like finally meet her in as person as you can be on Zoom. <laughs> so welcome, Tori. How are you doing? Hi, Alex. Thank you. I am doing well. I just told you about my little... Um pet feeding mishap that just happened before this call. But other than that, I am doing great. How are you? I'm good. And you're like literally on the other side of the world. It is 9 p.m. where Tori is in Seattle, right? And it is 8 a.m. where I am. Uh, It's now 8 a.m. in the morning, Abu Dhabi. So for me, it's Saturday morning. For you, it's Friday night, (laughs) which is super cool. Yeah. So let's start out this episode by, I just want to get a little bit of like a background on you, like who you are, where you're from, um, what you do, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I live in Seattle. I was pretty much born and raised in Seattle. Um, I say Seattle because I'm actually from a very small town that nobody has ever heard of, Mm -hmm. like 40 minutes south of the actual city of Seattle called Covington. Very, very small town. Like one of my best friends had goats and chickens and horses. So if you, if that could paint the picture for you, that's how small town it was. I am currently in grad school uh, to be a child counselor or child psychologist. We'll figure that out when I get there. And I nanny in between working on RPG. Wow. Yeah. I see on your social media all the time. It just seems like you're so full on. Like, running a business and school, having a job. It's, it's wild. It's impressive. It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. I guess when you, when you love what you're doing with the RPG, it's, uh, do you feel like, yeah, you know, for RPG, it doesn't ever really feel like work because a lot mm-hmm. of what I'm doing is like creating connection and making new friends that are more aligned with who I am than before. And so if I spend a weekend doing a virtual retreat or I spend a weekend hosting an event to me, that's like what I would want to be doing with my free time anyway. And so it's, it's so fulfilling and it brings me so much genuine joy that it doesn't always feel like work. Sometimes it does. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that, that it doesn't feel like work sometimes because creating content can be tough when you're constantly trying to think of ideas and then you have, you know, I have deadlines for school and everything like that. So the balance of it can be really tough. But as far as like the social aspect and uh, growing the community and getting to know people within the community and spending time with them, that's not work to me at all. Like, that's so joyful for me that it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. And when you're talking like that, it sounds like me and my, I have like an online sober yoga community. And like, I would say the same thing. Like, people say to me often, they're like, Alex, like you need to get some like friends other than your clients. And I'm like, I, but (laughs) why? (laughs) Oh my gosh. That is so funny. Yeah. All of my friends for a while were just on the internet and I'm like, okay, what does this say about me? But it's because I just met all these incredible sober people through RPG that just happened to live other places in the world. And I was like, okay, I should probably start making some like in-person connections so that not every single friend is virtual at this point. Yeah. Oh, I totally get it. I totally get it. (laughs) So let's go back a little bit. And I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about like when you started drinking um, and what things influenced your drinking. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I started drinking and partying very young. Um, 13, 14, I was hanging out with older people. A lot of things influenced my drinking, but probably the number one thing was I have a mom who's an alcoholic and then a dad who drug addict, alcoholic, um, but wasn't my primary caregiver. So kind of like in and out of the picture, but I mean, I don't remember a time without alcohol in my life. Like I remember being eight years old and knowing that my mom was drunk by the way her lips looked or by the way she was talking and not being able to really process that in a way where I was like, Oh, this makes me feel bad. But I knew that she was different when she drank. And I knew Mm -hmm. that I felt unsafe when she drank. Um, and that was as young as eight years old, second grade. So there really was never ever a time that I remember where drinking wasn't a large part of my life. And then it was always, I'll never be like her. I'll never drink like that as I got older. And, you know, 
I started hanging out with older people and that's what people did in my small town to, you know, have the time pass. And yeah, it went from drinking to ecstasy. Uh, I tried to crack one time when I was blacked out drunk, Molly, cocaine, and then it just kind of spiraled from there. So how did your drinking or your, your drug use all escalate over time? Oh my goodness. Well, I think it just like kind of changed shape. So when I was younger, it was more house parties and things like that. And then I got to be in my early twenties and it was really normalized for all of us to get dressed up and go out on a Friday night and black out. And we'd wake up and we'd laugh about how we didn't remember what happened or we didn't remember who we hooked up with or where so-and-so ended up because we Mm -hmm. lost them at some point in the night or how much money we had spent on the Uber and looking at our bank account and kind of making light of this really horrible, toxic lifestyle. And I did that, the whole going out, getting dressed up thing for until I stopped drinking. So from the time I turned probably 20 because I had a fake ID to the time I stopped drinking and I was 25, almost 26 at the time and I'm 27 now. So it just, it changed shape but it was always the same thing. It was always really toxic. I never really had a control, had control over it. I always felt anxiety. Always. There was never a time when I was drinking where I woke up the next morning and felt really cool about the things that I did the night before. It was always anxiety inducing for me because I had had anxiety and PTSD from my childhood and the drinking and drug use just made it so much worse. It was adding fuel to the fire. So the anxiety was always there. The poor decisions were always there. The blacking out was always there. It just looked different the older I got. Mm -hmm. And what was the moment that made you like want to quit or want to stop drinking? There wasn't a moment, which is so funny because I feel like I get asked that a lot. There wasn't a moment. It was all of these little moments mm-hmm. where, you know, I'd be laughing about the things that we would laugh about that weren't funny as far as what, how we got home or this and that. And deep inside, I wasn't laughing. And that happened over and over and over again to the point where I couldn't laugh about it anymore. And we were getting older. And when I say we, I mean like my friend group that I was partying with, but I should say I, I was getting older and the final straw for me, which is not at all the worst thing that has ever happened when I was drinking. It just happened to be the last thing was I went to New Jersey with my boyfriend at the time to meet his dad's side of the family it was during the holidays and they're Jewish. So we were celebrating Hanukkah over a period of time and there was a lot of wine and there was a lot of drinking and drinking was very normalized in his family. And there was one night where I drank more than everybody else in the family. A large group of people were there. And then I remember in the morning looking over at my boyfriend and kind of having this pit in my stomach that I knew he was mad at me and kind of being like, good morning. You know, are Mm -hmm. you mad at me? And he looked at me and said, I don't know how to say this, but you really embarrassed me last night. And I think that was really triggering for me specifically because I remember saying those exact words to my mom when we would go to like functions or she would meet friends, parents, or we would be anywhere social and she would get drunk and she would embarrass me. And I would tell her the next day, you really embarrassed me. Why did you have to get so drunk? And that was coming from his mouth. And so for me, it was a really big mirror in my face. And that was actually the day before New Year's Eve of 2019 going into 2020. Mm -hmm. At the time, we had no idea what 2020 was going to be. We had no idea. So I decided I was going to stop drinking. I didn't really have a long-term plan. I just kind of said in my head, that was a horrible feeling. I'm not going to do that again. And then 2020 happened and all of these like weird things were aligning in that I wasn't working at my regular job anymore. And I started talking about my sober journey online and then started creating virtual meetings because everybody else was at home. And little did I know sober Instagram was a thing. And 
people were also struggling the same way I was with their drinking. And then RPG just kind of blossomed in the way that it has, because I think there was a lot of things at play, but one of the things was that a lot of us were at home, Mm -hmm. isolated away from people and fed up with our drinking. Yeah. It's like grown so quickly. Like I've been following along and, um, it just seems like, like you're almost at like 20 K followers now. Um, right. It just seems like it's just, there's so many, you're reaching so many people, um, which is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I think there's a reason why sober Instagram is a thing. And there's reason why there's so many of us who are connecting with each other in the space and we're all around the same age. And, yeah. um, it's because there's so many different alcoholic or uh, recovery communities that missed the mark on us, on the gray area drinkers, on the middle area where we weren't ready to say, I'm an alcoholic, um, but we were willing to say, I don't like the way drinking makes me feel. Totally. And I know when I was looking for communities or programs, um, there was such a limited um, availability for me um, here, like here in the Middle East, AA doesn't even really exist that much. There's a little bit of it. Like I think there's four episodes, not four episodes, four meetings in Abu Dhabi a week (laughs) episodes, but that was it. Like, right. There was, there was nothing. And so there's a really a need for it. And I think a lot of people in the sober Instagram world have started creating what they almost wish they had when they were getting sober, you know? 100%. I mean, I found sober Instagram and I about had a heart attack. I was like, what is this magical place (laughs) that makes sobriety look cool and fun and flirty and sassy? And it's something I can flaunt and be proud of instead of feel shame about. And I, I just, I was like, what a magical space this is. My, my mind was completely blown. Absolutely. And so tell me about in your journey getting sober, like what was the hardest part about it? Mm, That's a really good question. Um, I think what continues to be the hardest part and what has been the hardest part is not romanticizing drinking. Mm -hmm. So even though I know I live this really beautiful, sober life, it's something I believe in with my whole heart. I believe in it more than anything. I know that I'm living a joyful, sober life. There are still times when the sun is shining and it's hot out. And I'm like looking at people sitting on a patio, enjoying tacos and margaritas. And I'm like, Hmm, that seems like a really good idea. And it's a fleeting thought, but it's something that I have to constantly work at the longer I'm sober is not romanticizing drinking because maybe those people can have margaritas and have a taco and go home. And maybe they don't feel like shit in the morning and maybe they don't make fights with their boyfriends and maybe they don't wake up with debilitating anxiety and depression. But for me, I couldn't have that margarita. I would have three margaritas and then want to go take tequila shots at the bar next door and then come home and create a mess of my life and then feel horrible the next day. And so it's a constant battle for me to remember my why and to stay grounded in that this is the life that I want to live and that I will Mm -hmm. continue to live. And so sometimes it's playing the tape forward, which is something we talk about a lot in the sober spaces of what would happen if I did do that. And that helps. Um, And it comes and goes in waves. Like there's been six month periods where I really haven't had that thought. And then there will be three month periods where I have that thought once every two weeks. So just kind of like rolling with all the things that come with being sober in, in a society that's obsessed with alcohol. So I, I think it would be different had we live in a society where there's not alcohol commercials on the TV with mm-hmm. a girl in her bathing suit. And, you know, she's not hungover. She's not sloppy. She's like doing great. She's playing beach volleyball while drinking beer, which I've never done in my life. Yeah. So the world we live in makes it extra, extra hard. But I think the biggest thing, for me, as far as a challenge is just not romanticizing drinking and 
staying grounded in that this is the life that I chose and that I want to continue to choose. Totally. Yeah. And I think that that concept of like romanticizing the drink really touches on something that I really gained more and more awareness of the longer I was sober was like how my thoughts shaped my reality. Right. And you can shape, you can decide like, oh, I'm so lucky that I get to be um, sober and not hungover, or you can be in this headspace of like, this sucks. I wish I was drinking with them. And like, you can create right. a shitty situation just out of like what you're thinking, you know, right. or how you're feeling too. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is I have to be aware of how I'm feeling. Like, am I hungry? Did I not get much sleep last night? Am I stressed about schoolwork? Is that why I'm being so pissy about right. not being able to have a margarita? Cause there's some days where I'm like, Ooh, look at them having that margarita. That sucks. Like, it probably mm-hmm. tastes terrible because re- in reality, tequila doesn't taste good. I don't care who you are or what you say. Tequila does not taste good. <laughs> um, so it just, it, you're so right. It really just depends on your perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's so many other, as you mentioned, do so many other factors that like, it's just like gaining an awareness of like what's really going on and not acting on those, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. impulses and habit loops that we once did. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. It, and I think sobriety for me has been the biggest thing it's done is just made me a more conscious person. Mm-hmm. I'm not only aware of drinking, but I'm aware of everything else. I'm aware of other people drinking. I'm aware of my friendships. I'm aware of my relationship patterns. I'm aware of my triggers. I'm aware of why I would drink. What point would I get to where I felt like drinking to the point of blacking out yeah. to the point of falling over puking on myself. Like my body was giving up on me. I was completely poisoned to the point where I was puking, falling, having to be taken care of. What led me to that point? So the biggest thing sobriety has done, I feel like is just made me a more conscious and aware person altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was kind of going to bring me to my next question. I was going to ask you like, what are the best parts of being sober? Oh my gosh, everything, 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 everything. It's, it's amazing. It's so amazing, man. I love getting to know myself. That's been so fun and thrilling to figure out who I actually am and what I actually like to do and the people I actually want to spend my time with. Um, I've made a ton of new connections that are so much more aligned with who I actually am. Um, I've tried a bunch of things, some that stuck and some that didn't. I remember I just moved out of my old apartment and I moved into a new place earlier this Mm -hmm. month and I was going through all of my old stuff and I found this box that to me represented my early sobriety and it had in it all these like watercolor paintings that I did in early sobriety. And this was when the pandemic was like real, real people Mm -hmm. were not leaving their houses pandemic. And so I bought watercolor paints from Amazon and I thought that was going to be my thing. And I remember I would watercolor paint these flowers and I would be like, who wants a handwritten love letter from me on Instagram? And that's how I spent my time was I would watercolor these flowers and send people love letters in the mail. And it just reminded me of like early sobriety, figuring out what it was that I wanted to do with all this extra free time. Mm-hmm. And I, I just like wanted to hug younger me and be like, Oh, you're trying to figure it out. I love that. So I think the best part is just getting to know yourself and trying things. If they work, they work. If they don't, they don't, that's okay. And just getting to know myself, but also other people who are in similar stages of their lives where they're ready to do the healing. They're ready to do the work and Man, it, everything about it has been really, really joyful. Also, the childlike joy, I think. Um, when you make sober friends, you guys can't drink wine as a social lubricant. So it can be awkward. You know, it's like, hey, we're on a girl date, and I want to be your friend, and you want to be my friend. And so I found through making sober friends, we do really funny, silly, childlike things that I haven't done since I was a little girl. And it's been so much fun. Mm-hmm. We did like prank calling. I just went to Ocean Shores with a couple of friends. <laughs> uh, so we're friends and we, uh, which is so stupid and immature, but we laughed so hard and had such a good time prank calling people. I don't recommend doing that. It's not always the nicest thing, but that or going on walks or getting coffee mm-hmm. or having actual deep, meaningful conversations. So everything about it has been 
really wonderful. So true. It's like a lot of the events that I do in Abu Dhabi now, um, I do a lot of like sober sort of brunches and retreats and there's so much, um, like every time it's like, let's paint a picture, let's make a bracelet, let's, we're going to make vision boards at my upcoming retreat. And it's just things that you wouldn't do because the events would just be, let's sit at the table and drink. Right. And 100%, they would be centered around alcohol. 100%. We just had a RPG event in partnership with a company called The Soul Bar. And we had a... Oh, I uh, saw that. That looked amazing in the tent, right? The brunch? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a really big tent because it was supposed to rain that day, but the sun ended up coming out in Seattle. Anyway, we sat and we talked and we drank alcohol-free mimosas for hours. And went hours passed when the event was supposed to end. And we were kind of talking and I was like, what would this event have been had these been real mimosas and we all just kind of stopped and thought about it for a minute. And one of the girls was like, I would be running to and from the bathroom, you know, having to go to the bathroom. We'd all be talking about what bar we could go to next. And we wouldn't have had the chance to actually talk and get to know each other. But because we were actually sitting there as our true selves for four plus hours, I genuinely got to know everybody in the tent. It's amazing. Yeah, it's so special. It really is. So amazing. Sounds like uh, you do really similar sort of events and things as I do, but like on the other side of the world. So maybe we could uh, link up sometime when COVID ends. (laughs) Why are you in, um, I don't want to say it wrong. Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. um, I came over here um, when I was 23 to become a teacher So I'm from Toronto and in Canada, the teaching jobs are not uh, very easy to come by. Like once you graduate teacher's college, you have to be on the substitute teacher list for a long time. And so they really, really pushed us or like they really encouraged us to seek international jobs. Like they had a big recruitment fair. And so um, I came over here. I moved to Kuwait originally. Um, Oh my God. it's It's a wild story because Kuwait was alcohol free. And so um, I was living in this tiny little conservative country, learning how to make my own booze, you know, finding all the ways to get it under the table. And and then Abu Dhabi and Dubai is kind of like the party central of the region because there's so many of these conservative little countries around where expats are living and they want to come and fly here and party. And so I was coming here on the weekend, partying all the time. And here it's like, it's, oh, it's so bizarre. It's like, totally normal to start drinking at like noon on a Friday. Our weekends are Friday, Saturday. And and it's this huge thing brunches here where people, people get drunk from noon to three and it's not the locals. It's like all of us, like the expats. It's, it's like picture, you know, being in an all-inclusive Caribbean resort. Right. Right. (laughs) We're at all times of the day. Yeah. And so, and when I got sober, I was genuinely the only person that I knew here, you know, and all my friends were still in this brunch world. And and even because, you know, it's so forbidden as part of the local culture to to talk about booze, there's like no one else in the region doing sober work. And so um, it's just been like, yeah, it was like a super isolating experience. And actually for a long time, I wasn't even posting on social. I was like very quiet about it wasn't trying not to post on social media because I'm a teacher and I'm like I don't want my students parents to find this and I'm actually quitting teaching in a couple weeks and so I've hit this it's almost like this blossoming of like I don't really care (laughs) anymore and I feel like that was holding me back for a long time but yeah so moved here was two-year contract never thought you know it's seven years later and I'm starting a business here and like this is my home so wow that is so interesting. Yeah. I had no idea when we were emailing that you were on the other side of the country and you said PDT. And I'm like, what is PDT time? I'm trying to think. And I had to Google it, but then I wanted to double check with you that I had that correctly. So, wow. What a story. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, it's, it's cool because so much of what I do is so international, you know, because I, I work a lot with expats who are in these like isolated places and, um, it's super cool. We do have some clients in North America, um, and the time zones work really well in that like 4 PM here is like 8 AM Eastern standard. So I'm able to do yoga with 
like people in the morning in North America. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's the story in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah. My mom went to the Maldives and mm-hmm. it, it was, a. she's been sober now for two years and she said that she loved it because she didn't have the pressure of drinking because it's a non-drinking. Right. Country. And that's the thing when you were talking about kind of the culture of booze and, you know, the ads and everything, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, that has been one of the blessings of being here is like, even, I mean, the, it's changing. It's we're, we're becoming more modern and more progressive. So it's changing. But for a long time, like you couldn't even be sitting on a, a patio, for example, with a drink that wasn't in a black glass. Um, so they have black wine glasses, black cups so that you can't even see beer and wine publicly. Um, and like, there's no ads, like the the alcohol stores are black walls. And so it's just a different world. And, and, you know, if, if local people, it's, it's not being shoved down their throats, you know, it's, that's been an amazing thing. Once I kind of stepped out of that little brunch, like (laughs) matrix I was living in, I feel like my everyday life, I'm not being forced this whole party thing, the way North America does. Oh yeah. It's, it's everywhere. I did actually see a alcohol free beer commercial, the Heineken Mm -hmm. zero proof. So I I did see that over when there was Super Bowl, and that was, and that was interesting. The way that they marketed it was like, you can drink dad, but I'm going to be the driver tonight. And, And I thought that was even weird. So yeah. Yeah, the the marketing and things I never ever thought about until I got sober and was introduced to sober Instagram and read Holly Whitaker's book, but like a woman. It's amazing. And yeah, that blew my mind and now I can't unsee it. So once you start to notice it, you can't unsee it. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's talk a little bit about RPG. We've kind of, you talked about it in the beginning, um, but tell me about like what inspired you to create RPG? What's your vision for it in the future? Yeah. What's so funny is people ask me that, but it was never something I set out to do ever. It was never an intentional game plan that I was going to create this sober community. I was sober for two weeks. And I remember this specifically, I was in the car in the morning on my way to work and took a video on my personal Instagram and was like, Hey, I'm two weeks sober. Are you all interested in me doing something called sober diaries where I post the changes I'm noticing and blah, 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 blah. And I think to me, that is evidence that even though I didn't say it at the time, I was thinking of this being long-term. I didn't know it yet, but my internal self knew it before I actually said it and knew it. So I was really surprised so many of my friends from high school or people I'd met through working and through my life were like, yes, I want to stop drinking too. I hate the way I feel when I drink. And I probably had like less than a thousand followers, just like a normal personal Instagram account. And so I started posting that. I started posting posts. I did like a three month. And then I have a friend who I grew up with named Hannah who was doing web design And I was like, listen, I want a place where I can put all of these virtual meetings that I'm doing in one place. And so we created the website and then I started making all these friends online. Like I said, my, my virtual friendships Mm -hmm. (laughs) that took over my life. Here I am a year later and they're like some of my best friends, but, um, started making all of these virtual friendships, these people that I just adore and I was so aligned with them and we were getting so much from each other in our meetings. And then it just happened. Like it just, RPG just happened. It was so meant to be, it was so aligned with where I was in my life and the universe just made it kind of happen that way. It was just like one thing led to another thing, led to another thing. The community has grown. We have over 400 members and every single amazing human that is a part of RPG has inspired me to keep going. Like they all have such incredible stories of resilience or incredible stories of strength. Like some of these people have been through so much, through so much, so much loss, so much grief, so much pain, so much heartbreak. And they are still such joyful, wonderful, strong people who genuinely want to help other people. It is so inspiring. 
Wow, that's incredible. 400 people. You're touching in a lot of lives. Sure you're really yeah, it's been, that. yeah. And then we have people who are also leading the meetings now on their own. We have like our own little like subgroups where members of RPG are now hosting RPG meetings. And I just love that it's community led and it's just blossomed into this like really, really beautiful thing. And it's, it's so genuine and it's so intentional. I'm like, I'm so grateful. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So if you would have any advice for someone who is just starting out a sober journey, thinking about uh, taking a break from drinking, what would it be? Okay. So I always say go 30 days. This is always, always my advice is to just try 30 days because I have been in cognitive behavioral therapy for six years. I was in therapy when I was blacking out and my therapist tried, bless her heart, for a really long time to try to get me to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And there was just no way. I was just not going to listen to her. And she told me, she was like, well, why don't you go 30 days? And me, I'm like, oh, that's a challenge. Sure, I'll go 30 days and I'll show her, you know, that it doesn't make that much of a difference. Whatever. I don't have a problem drinking. So I went 30 days and I absolutely loved it. I went to her office with a list on my phone of all of the incredible changes I was seeing in myself. And I listed them off to her and was like all excited. This was a couple years before I actually got sober. And even though I didn't stay sober that time and it, and it kind of like fell to the back burner after a while, that was really when the light switch switched. And then two years later, I think if that switch hadn't gone off two years earlier, I wouldn't have been able to really make the change. And so whether you stick with it or not, I think doing 30 days, no alcohol will make you realize things about your drinking patterns. And if you want to go longer than 30 days, go longer than 30 days. If you end up going back to drinking, that's fine. But you never know what could switch on years down the road from taking that break. It's so true. And I love that idea of just like dipping in your toes, you know, like when I quit, it was 28 days, you know, it was like, I'm just gonna do this challenge. Never foresaw that, you know, two years later, I would be sober yoga girl, (laughs) you know, doing, making a career out of it. And so um, you're totally right in like the whole forever can seem daunting. Um, So just take it like bit by bit, chunk by chunk and you know, it might not, um, you know, maybe you take 30 days off and then you go back to drinking and that's okay. Um, and sometimes people need a few little trips around the circle before it sticks. Yeah. That's great advice. Just kind of take it a little chunk and see where it leads you. I just say 30 days, you can do it for 30 days. You can do that for 30 days and you don't need to tell the whole world and you don't need to call yourself sober and you don't need to make a sober Instagram about it. Just go 30 days and log your feelings. And just, that's just, that's it. That's all you have to do to start there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we just kind of wrap up, do you have any events or anything coming up? Like where can um, my listeners find you online? Yeah, so we actually have a virtual retreat, retreat with the the Sober Otter that we're doing tomorrow. It's called Boozeless Boot Camp. That's Amazing. Um, but we're going to be doing things like that all the time. I'm hosting an event in New York coming up soon with another girl named Alex Williams in the community, but they can find me at retiredpartygirl.com or on Instagram at the retired party girl. Awesome. Well, I'll put your links in the bio um, of the episode and um, it is super, it was super nice to finally meet you, Tori. I really appreciate it. Um, And I look forward to kind of staying connected in, in the sober world. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. (laughs) Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.